Good evening, everyone. My name is Erin Shea, and I'm the head of adult programming here at Darien Library. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. This is actually the very first event in our Fall Meet the Author 2012 series. And I just wanted to remind you that if, well, I'm sure you will enjoy tonight's event, I hope. And then on your way out, you can pick up a brochure that has the other authors that we have coming this fall. I'd like to just briefly mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your contributions to make events like tonight possible. This evening's guest is the author of four works of fiction, most recently the ABA bestseller, Any Bitter Thing. Well, that's actually not most recently. Most recently is the book we're going to talk about tonight. Her other fiction includes My Only Story, a finalist for the Kate Show Pin Award, Ernie's Ark, and Secret Language. Her essays, articles, and reviews have appeared in various publications, and her widely anthologized short stories have won a Pushcart Prize and been featured on public radio, including the NPR program, Selected Shorts. She also writes books for writers and teachers, including The Pocket Muse, Volumes 1 and 2. She lives in Portland, Maine, where she conducts a writing program for women at the Maine Correctional Center. And the book that we're going to talk about tonight, which is called When We Were the Kennedys, I just want to give a special shout out to my colleague Jen Dayton, who has just been telling anyone who will listen about how much she loves this book. And it first came into my ear because uh, it, it, it was blurbed by a writer named Michael Paternity in his Mother works here, and she's here tonight as well. And Jen told me that she saw that he blurbed it and was like, oh, well, I'll check this out. And then she absolutely loved it. And it's spreading like wildfire throughout our town. We have something like 25 holds on our tons of copies. So please join me in welcoming tonight Miss Monica Wood. Thank you, Erin. To get my glasses. Last time I did a book tour, I did not need these. <laughs> but time marches on. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I was telling Erin, I think, that I live in Portland, Maine. And so um, when I first said I would, they invited me to come. And I said, oh, sure, you know, Connecticut. And uh, I thought it was probably maybe right outside of Hartford or something. I'd never I'd even heard of Darien, Connecticut. So I'm sorry, but I, I hadn't. And um, and then I looked at it on a map. I said, oh my gosh, I might as well be driving to New York City. Um, so I enlisted a family friend to be my media escort today. So I actually didn't even have to drive down here. I stayed in outside of Hartford last night. And we had a great time driving down and chatting and catching up. So it all worked out beautifully. Uh, the book is called When We Were the Kennedys, a memoir from Mexico, Maine. Can everybody hear me OK? Usually my voice carries all right. Good. So what I would like to do is I'm going to read the prologue, because the prologue really contains everything that happens, it, it, even if in a small way, all the themes that are kind of played out throughout the book. And then what I'm going to do is just stop very briefly and talk about um, how the book is constructed. And then I'm going to read a scene to you. And then I'll answer whatever questions you might have after that. And I also want to give a shout out to Barrett Books and all the indie booksellers who are still here after the great purge of the last 10 years. I can't even tell you how much I love independent bookstores. My home bookstore is Longfellow Books in Portland, Maine. They're two of my favorite people run the place. And I'm also very proud to say that this book was um, on the NEBA bestseller list for three weeks in a row and maybe coming back. And that's the uh, New England indie bestseller list. So I owe a lot to the independent booksellers in my area and in areas around the country. OK, so the prologue is called my Mexico. In Mexico, Maine, where I grew up, you couldn't find a single Mexican. We'd been named by a band of settlers as a shout out to the Mexican revolutionaries, a puzzling gesture, its meaning long gone. But by the time I came along, my hometown retained not a shred of solidarity, unless you counted a bottle of Tabasco sauce moldering in the door of somebody's fridge. We had a badly painted sombrero on the Welcome to Mexico sign, but the only Spanish I ever heard came from a scratched 45 of Doris Day singing Que Sera Sera. 
In fourth grade, after discovering that the world included a country called Mexico, I spent several befuzzled days wondering why it had named itself after us. Sister Ernestine adjusted my perspective with a pull-down map of the world on which the country of Mexico showed up as a pepper-red presence and its puny namesake did not appear at all. In high summer, when tourists in paneled station wagons caravaned through town on their way to someplace else, hankies pressed comically to their noses against the stench of paper being made, I sat with my friends on the stoop of Neri's Market to play license plate. Sucking on blue popsicles, we observed the procession of vehicles carrying strangers we'd never glimpse again and accumulated points for every out-of-state plate. These people didn't linger to look around or buy anything, though once in a while a woman, always a woman with the smiley red lips all women had then, popped out of an idling car to ask the posse of sunburnished children, why Mexico? We looked at one another. I was the one in the wrinkled t-shirt bought at the Alamo by my priest uncle, Father Bob, who loved to travel. Or maybe that was my little sister, Kathy, or my next bigger sister, Betty, or one of our friends. Who could tell one kid from the next? White kids in similar clothes, Catholic children of mill workers and housewives. We lived in triple-decker apartment buildings. We called them blocks. Or in nondescript houses that our fathers painted every few years. The only Mexico we knew was this one, ours, with its single main street and its one bowling alley and its convent and church steeples and our fathers over there just across the river toiling inside a brick and steel complex with heaven-high smokestacks that shot great gorgeous steam clouds into the air so steadily we couldn't tell where mill left off and sky began. Like most Irish Catholic families in 1963, mine had a boiled dinner on Sundays after Mass and salmon loaf on Fridays. We had pictures of Pope John and President John and the Sacred Heart of Jesus hung over our red couch. And on holidays, my big brother, the front man in a local band called The Impacts, came with his wife and babies and guitar to sing story songs packed with repentant jailbirds and useless regret and soldiers bleeding to death on heathery fields. In my friend Denise Valancourt's French Catholic family, they ate meat pies, tortières, on Christmas Eve and sang comic Québécois songs about mistaken identity and family kerfuffles. I had another friend, Sheila, who lived just our side of the mexico rumford Bridge in a Protestant, two-child, flood-prone, single-family family house. And another friend, Janet, who lived atop her parents' tavern, the regulars marshmallowed onto the bar stools by three in the afternoon, listening to Elvis on the jukebox. At St. Teresa's, we greeted our teachers with a sing-song, Bonjour, ma soeur diagrammed morally loaded sentences at flip-top desks and drew flattering pictures of the Blessed Mother. We went to Mass on Sunday mornings and High Holy Days, singing four-part tantumergos from the choir loft in a teamwork reminiscent of our fathers sweating out their shifts in noisy, cavernous rooms. The nuns taught us that six went into twelve twice, that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, that California exported avocados, and Maine exported paper. Tons and tons of paper, the kind our fathers made. Though our elders in Mexico, who spoke French or Italian or Lithuanian or English with a lilt, cherished their cultural differences, which were deep and mysterious and preserved in family lore, what bound us the children, was bigger and stronger and far more alluring than the past. It was the future we shared, the promise of a long and bountiful life. The unlikely source of that promise penetrated our town like a long and endless sigh. The Oxford Paper Company, that boiling hulk on the riverbank, the great equalizer that took our fathers from us every day and eight hours later gave them back in an unceasing loop of shift work. The Oxford, we chummily called it, as if it were our friend. From nowhere in town could you not see it. The mill, 
the rumbling, hard-breathing monster that made steam and noise and grit and stench and dreams and livelihoods and paper. It possessed a scoured industrial beauty as awesome and ever-changing as the leaf-plumped hills that surrounded us. It made a world unto itself, overbearing and irrefutable, claiming its ground along the Androscoggin, a wide and roiling river that cracked the floor of our valley like the lifeline on a palm. My father made his living there, and my friends' fathers, and my brother and my friends' brothers, and my grandfather and my friends' grandfathers. They crossed the footbridge over the river's tainted waters, carrying their lunch pails into the mill's overheated gullet five, six, sometimes seven days a week. In every household in town, the story we children heard, between the lines, from mothers, fathers, memes and pepes, nanas and nonas, implied in the merest gesture of the merest day, was this. The mill called us here to have you. This was one powerful story, powerful and engulfing, erasing all that came before, just like the mill that had made this story possible. In each beholden family, old languages were receding into a multicultural twilight as the new sun-flooded story took hold. The story of us, American children of well-paid laborers, beneficiaries of a dream. Every day our mothers packed our father's lunch pails as we put on our school uniforms. Every day a fresh chance on the dream path our parents had laid down for us. Our story like the mill, hummed in the background of our every hour, a tale of quest and hope that resonated similarly in all the songs, in all the blocks and houses, in the headlong shouts of all the children at play, in the murmur of all the graces said at all the kitchen tables. In my family, in every family, that story, with its implied happy ending, hinged on a single Beautiful, unbreakable, immutable fact. Dad. Then he died. So that is the prologue. And lest you think this book is a total bummer, uh, I am going to read a uh, scene to you about our landlords who were Lithuanian immigrants. Um, <clears throat> yeah, some people have read the book already know the Norcuses. <clears throat> um, so what happens from here, ap after the prologue, what the reader does is follows the Wood family through our tragedy of losing our father and breadwinner. Uh, and the family that my father leaves behind, he drops dead on his way to the mill one morning. Uh, and the family is my brother, Barry, who's 27 years old at the time of this story with a wife and children of his own. And he lives in the town just upriver. And then there's my sister, Anne, who's a 21-year-old first-year school teacher still living at home with us. And she actually would be my school teacher when I became a high school student and gave me a B in English, by the way. <laughs> and then there's the three little girls. There's my sister, Betty, who's mentally disabled, and she's 12 years old at the time of the story. I am nine years old, and my sister, Kathy, is eight years old. So that's, that's the Wood family. But what I wanted to do was write a personal story of loss, but in the largest possible context. So the other threads that are kind of twining through this narrative are twofold. One is that, of course, the Kennedy assassination also happens in 1963. And it's about how that national tragedy resonates in my little family. And what happens is my mother was actually quite ashamed to be widowed, which I have since discovered is not that unusual a reaction, especially at that time. Um, and there's something about seeing Jackie Kennedy's, the beauty of her grief, the way she made grief look graceful and beautiful, really helped my mother retain her own dignity in the face of her own widowhood. And for the children, I, in particular, I'm sure I was taking my cues from my mother, but I was mortified to be fatherless. And the idea that Caroline Kennedy, who had her own pony named Macaroni, um, had also lost her father so suddenly exactly the way I had, it had a really palliative effect on me as a child. 
So that is happening. And the other thing that is happening is in the towns of Rumford and Mexico at the time, the same year, we are bracing for a protracted labor strike at the Oxford Paper Company, which will change the relationship between the mill and the town forever after. And it's really the beginning, and the Oxford Paper Company becomes the emblem for that. It's the beginning of the long decline of American supremacy in manufacturing. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the book. But I'm going down to the micro level for this scene right here. And this takes place about a month after my father dies. And um, I have made friends with Denise Valancourt, who is still my dearest friend, by the way, and we're going to go on a 50th anniversary of friendship trip in a couple of weeks, believe it or not. We both turned 59 last week. And um, so uh, she's my new friend. This is fourth grade. And um, I have pretty much glommed myself onto the Valancourt family because my I have a big crush on Mr. Valancourt because he reminds me of my father. He's a lovely man and who works in the mill. And I have been eating over there about seven nights running at this point in the book. And my mother has informed me that well-brought-up children return, fa return favors of this nature. And she has instructed me to invite Denise up to our, we live on a third floor of one of the blocks, to, for supper. The only problem is that the Norcuses, our landlords, have many, many rules. No too much garbage. No go in garden, no put bike on grass, no put car in driveway, too much stairs. And what too much stairs means is that no non-resident child is allowed on the stairs, which poses an obvious obstacle if you want your friend to come up for supper. So the scene opens when I'm coming back from the store on an unrelated errand for my mother. The Norcuses, oh, and the other thing you need to know is that my childhood name was Moni, but Mrs. Norcus called me Money. <laughs> and the other thing is that at one point, uh, Jorgis is reading the Times, which is clearly not the New York Times. It's the Rumford Falls Times, which is our, our weekly, and we call it the Times. So in case you were wondering about that. <clears throat> the Norcuses came to America with rags on their feet. That's how mom and dad had always told it, an oft-repeated detail from which I assembled a larger drama Disembarkment in a cold rain, the words Mexico, Maine pinned to a rotting sleeve, the thronged and misty vista of New York Harbor. They'd stumbled at stiff kneed down a gangway, impossibly young and yearning to breathe free, a sepia toned couple impossible to connect with the technicolor czars who swivel their joint gaze toward me as I come up the driveway with my grocery bag. Hi, I say. I bend to pat Tootsie, tightening my grip on the bag. Lazy booty, Jorgis yells. He means the cat, a white tumbleweed with gum pink ears. Lazy booty, he yells again. Then a downpour of Lithuanian, accompanied by laughter or something, and a slashing gesture with his open palm. Translation one. I am happy my cat pleases you. Is she not exquisite? Translation two. I intend to chop off your head. Wait here while I prepare the cleaver. <laughs> um, I say, OK. <laughs> Sister Ernestine had skipped right over Lithuania, its war-torn history, its imports and exports. And so I'm left with no map, no assigned reading, no worksheets that might help me understand the Norcuses. Jurgis gives the cat a perfunctory pat and tromps down the stairs toward his backyard garden, leaving me alone with Mrs. Norcus. Alone. What you got, money? I freeze like a bunny in the brush. Money, what you got? Groceries, I say, caught literally holding the bag. Mrs. Norcus hooks the lip of the bag with one finger and peers in. Ash, ash, ticka, ticka, bush, bush. She shakes her head. Mum has a secret, and Mrs. Norcus knows what it is. She looked in the bag? Mum fumes, flinging the goods onto our narrow counter, the bloody shame of it for all to see. Beef kidney, packaged in cardboard and cellophane, red, pricey, bite size for the cat. 
In the Norcus's world, this petty crime against the frugal-minded, food chain-respecting citizens of the United States of America is a mortal sin of profligacy, certainly for a new widow with three little girls and a monthly social security check. But mum's a fool for animals, especially cats, and most especially Tom, our muscled, odoriferous, anvil-headed tabby who sits on the sewing machine all day staring into the birdcage. We have other cats, but Tom is mum's lover man now, her gentleman caller, her heater in the bed, and she'll do anything to make him happy, upgrading his chow in unwitting increments until he's eating exotic cuts we have to ask for special. The Norcuses, on the other hand, live from the land. Even now, so early in the summer, their vegetable garden has thickened with frilly rows of carrots and beets, its perimeter trimmed with lacy stalks of dill, pumpkin-colored marigolds, and dark fronds of rhubarb. They separate this bounty from the yard, no-going garden, with a gated wire fence lined with viburnums we call the snowball bushes. As mum rages in the kitchen, she looked in the bag? Mortified at being exposed as a spendthrift, I steal out to our back porch and look down. Jurgis is bent over, harvesting greens from the lettuce bed and weeding between clumps by hand. As the gardens, at the garden's northeast corner, just over the back fence, flourishes a second garden, equal in breadth, the one tilled by my friend Margie's nana, Jurgis's sister. Like Jurgis, Margie's Nana is out there too, slow moving between the bean poles in her swishing cottons. The siblings do not speak or wave or even face each other over the stone's throw that separates them. Nana and Jurgis's only sign of kinship survives in their rainbow of vegetables, a paean to the motherland. They live close enough to call Isfeketa if one of them sneezes but they've been hardened by family trespasses too fossilized to undo. Instead of forgiveness, they cultivate cabbages big as bowling balls, and they harvest their prizes alone. Haunted by their slow motion, their bent backs, their profound silence, I feel in my own heart a bloom of pain and rush back inside to my own broken family. The nerve, Mum is saying, slapping pork chops into the electric frying pan. Little things knock her clean off her axis now. The nerve of that woman. Here, Anne murmurs, let me. It's actually too early to start supper. Time slips around for Mum these days. So my sister turns off the pan, removes the chops, sets them on wax paper to salt and pepper them. Mum forgot. She sits down hard. Why is she so angry? I'd like to give them a piece of my mind, she says. But she can't. She's afraid of being evicted, a new word since deceased, a word even more sinister than strike. Can I go get Denise now, I ask. Go ahead, Mum says, composing herself. She's still fuming, but doesn't want us to know. I get there moments too late to watch Mr. Valancourt unpack his lunch pail, that coming home ritual I love. He's been called back in, something wrong with the number five paper machine. I hide my little wallop of disappointment by telling Mrs. Valancourt that we're having pork chops special for Denise. Over here they're having meatloaf, which I hate but would eat anyway. Make sure to say thank you, Mrs. Valancourt reminds Denise as we head out. We walk from her block to mine, around the mailbox and down Gleason Street and then Worthley Avenue and then, oh shoot, the Norcuses are back at their post, settled into chairs. Jurgis is reading the Times. Mrs. Norcus isn't. Ush, ush, she murmurs to her husband. Just act normal, I tell my friend. What? Shh, do what I do. We saunter up the driveway. We make a move for the stairs. Jurgis lowers his newspaper with a menacing crackle. No bring friend, he growls. Too much stairs. A squeak of shock from Denise, who rabbits back into the driveway and gapes at me, aghast. Now what? I look up to the third floor, my mother so near and yet so far. Feigning indifference, I trudge over to my friend, my consolation, my supper guest, and whisper, pretend we're going back to your house.
We stroll away, then run the whole block in the opposite direction, ending up on the blind side of the house where even the Norcuses, who have more eyes than a fly, can't spot us. From here, we hatch a multi-stage plan for smuggling Denise past the border guards, splitting up like soldiers on a recon mission. Denise makes a dash around back and dives behind the snowball bushes to hide. I continue up the driveway, plunk myself on the front steps, and pretend to bask in the late afternoon daylight. Mrs. Norcus has gone inside, probably to cook supper, but Jorgis is still here, eyeing me over the top edge of the paper. Where's Totsi? I ask him, hoping he'll go inside to fetch the cat, whom he adores. But he wasn't born yesterday. I glance at the shivering snowball bush. I wait and wait. Even the Norcuses have to pee on occasion. But nothing happens until Mrs. Norcus calls Jorgis in for supper. He folds up his paper, eyes me again. And as soon as he turns his back, I shriek, now, whereupon Denise springs from the green like a flushed quail. <laughs> ush, ush, ticka, ticka, Jorgis shouts. No bring friend, too much stairs. Make stop, you jump. Mrs. Norcus, too, has suddenly materialized, towering at four square. Instead of breaking for the stairs, as I do, Denise recoils in terror. Please don't go, I think. They're harmless. More than anything, I want Mum to get her wish for me to look like a well-brought-up returner of favors. I'm at the top of the first flight, but Denise is down there in the yard, her mouth forming a little O oh of horror. So I trudge earthward and join her. The Norcus is faintly push-pushing in Lithuanian. Denise regards me with something akin to awe. Maybe, I say to her, think, think, but I've got nothing. Then, a dainty tread on the stairs above us, and Anne appears. Bermuda shorts, crisp white blouse, hair done up in a chignon, the pretty school teacher on summer break. She smiles at the Norcuses, who nod in turn. Supper time, she says, and we follow like found lambs, away from the thwarted Norcuses and toward mum's pork chops and baked potato and cherry pie. All of it smells so good. Anne and mum exchange a look. Mum pulls out a chair for my friend. Come on in, I say with a theatrical sweep of the arm. Welcome. Here is our laden table, our full cupboards, my mother spooning out applesauce, and my sisters waiting. A family at supper. Everything, to all appearances, still whole. And then I'm going to switch to the end of the chapter just to put, there's a little coda about the Norcuses, and it just kind of puts them in their full human context, which I think is necessary for this reading. <clears throat> the Norcuses, of course, had sorrows of their own. No see my mama again, Mrs. Norcus had told mum one day when asked about her family back in Lithuania. The Norcuses let down their guard sometimes, punctuated their soldiering fortitude with glints of kindness. I feared their mossy English, their owlish stares, their curtains that looked spun by giant spiders. But it was Jurgis, it is said, who'd asked to hold the newborn me on my first day home. When I was three, I named Mum's parakeet Jorgis, apparently detecting something in our landlord that was feathery and soft and aching to communicate. The Norcuses gave us squash and tomatoes from the Forbidden Garden. They'd once invited us to their camp at Roxbury Pond, urging us to glory in the view, the water, the new spindles on the porch rail. More swim in pond, they'd called. More eat Hamburg. We'd come back baffled and sunburned, dad chuckling at the wheel, our trunk stuffed with freshly cut flowers. What had they thought of dad? Had they seen him as a fellow traveler who had abandoned a bucolic, beloved, but dead-end homeland to embrace an industrial rebirth? Or did they view his journey, a brief ferry ride from Prince Edward Island, and then a train to prosperity and happiness as the voyage of a pretender, a man who had it too easy. The Norcus has never said of dad, so young, oh, so young. They'd gone quiet over the news and chastened. Mrs. Norcus probably sent up some blinis. They'd liked dad, who didn't? But to the Norcuses, 
our tragedy must have seemed ordinary enough. 57 years, not a long life, but not a short one either. A gentle sorrow in the grander scheme of sorrow. How easily dad had acquired what he wanted, work, spouse, children. The Norcuses too had acquired these things, but unlike dad, who came here healthy and well shod, they'd left so much more behind, their past gone for good. The Norcuses picked through our stuff and tossed almost nothing themselves, for they looked upon the trash shed as a repository for second chances. We need our things. We protect our things. We make rules around them if we have to. The Norcuses guarded their stairs because they loved their stairs. They had bought those stairs and the building attached to them by leaving their mamas and their cherry trees and their big blue sky and their language and their nation. They guarded their garden because they loved their garden. Every carrot and parsnip and rhubarb stem. They guarded their driveway because they loved their driveway. Every crack and fissure and shiny knot of frost heaved tar. It took years for me to know this, to see how loss can tighten your grip on the things still possible to hold. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I was telling somebody the other day that um, this is my first nonfiction book, my first memoir, and I was kind of allergic to the whole idea of memoir. And uh, I was asked by um, Wes McNair, who is the poet laureate of Maine, a wonderful man. He's about nine feet tall and very sweet <coughs> face. And um, we got together. I saw him at a book event somewhere. And I was talking with him. And he said, you know, I'm putting together this anthology. And as I'm getting some of the state's writers to write about their experience of growing up, or their experience of Maine, period. And he said, I would really love to have something from kind of inland. And I have a lot of coastal stuff. I have a couple things from Aroostook County. But I don't have, really have anything from that inland industrial Maine that most people don't know anything about. And um, so he asked me if I would do an essay for his anthology. And I said, Wes, I'd love to, but I'm really, I'm a novelist. I've done, that's all I've ever done is fiction writing. And I'd rather not. I tried to say it nicely. And he said, OK, well, I, I understand that. So I'm going to need it in two weeks. <laughs> and so I'm looking up at this guy. And he's very hard to say no to. He's a real sweetheart. And so I went home. And I thought, how the heck am I going to write about growing up in a place, A, that means as much to me as Mexico, Maine does. And that is just, it's huge. It's just a huge experience. I, did, I didn't really know what to do. And so I thought, well, I'll start the same way I start a novel. I start with a, the smallest possible moment and the most resonant moment. And that, of course, for me in my childhood was finding out that my father had died. So I wrote about that day as a way of implying what it is like to live in a place like Mexico, Maine at that time. And I was happy with the essay. Wes was happy with the essay. And I thought that was the end of things. And um, about a year later, I was um, kind of in a, a trough, a writing trough. And I thought, I think I'm going to write another piece, like kind of like a companion piece to that other thing. But I'm going to write it about my sister, Anne. And so I started writing this other essay. And it was maybe close to the end of that that I realized they weren't just companion pieces. They were a part of, a, of one thing. And two years later, I, well, one year later, I had a horrible draft. And two years later, I had the book. So that's how it started. And for this book, ironically, even though it's nonfiction, I did more research for this book than probably all of my novels put together. And the research was a complete delight, because it involved going back to people I had known as a child. And one of the people was uh, Mrs. Gagnon, who was our neighbor growing up in Mexico. And she, if anybody's read my novel, Any Bitter Thing, 
uh, there's a scene in there about the children next door going over to help this woman, her name is Vivienne in the book, to help her sew shoes for piecework from the factory. <clears throat> and this is what Mrs. Gagnon did. There was a, I think it was Bass Shoe Company that was out on Route 2, and they had a pickup drop-off place on Waldo Street in Rumford. And uh, there were many mothers in town who did, it was always women who did it, who did the piecework. So you'd go and you'd pick up like two big, um, uppers and lowers is what they called them. And they were those uh, like bass Weijin type shoes, you know, the moccasin type shoes. And so Mrs. Gagnon's job was to take the, the, the bottom and the top, just the top of it, and sew the toe end of the shoe. And it was very precise. It was, you had rawhide and you had to put it through this wax to make it really stiff. And you had these leather fingerless gloves so that you wouldn't hurt your palms on the, with the rawhide. And even though in their training they said that children were not allowed to do this, the bunch of paraphernalia, the wax and the everything, there was always a glove in your size no matter how little you were. So it was you know, a tacit okay that, and it was always a family event that children certainly involved in this. So Mrs. Gagnon had three little girls the same age as our youngest three girls. So we used to go over there and help her sew shoes. And it was my first job. It was certainly my first skill. And it wasn't the kind of thing that you said, oh, well, let the kids try it. We had to do it correctly. Because if you didn't, she wouldn't get paid for the shoes. So she would uh, start them off and tie them off. But we would learn how to do this pie crust sh uh, stitch. And so when I was doing the <coughs> research for the book, I said, I hope I have this whole thing right. So I called up Mrs. Gagnon, who still lives in Mexico. I hadn't seen her in probably since I was 15 years old. And she was still there in Mexico. And I told her, I said, this is one of the wood girls. And she goes, oh, I remember the girls. Uh, which one are you? And I said, I was the one who had the red hair. I was Moni. She goes, oh, I remember you. You come. I would love to see you. And so I went over and opened the door. And we had a huge crush on her when she was a mother in the neighborhood. She was really gorgeous. She had this kind of rippling auburn hair that went all the way down her back. She always had, they had nothing. Her husband worked in the woods, but she always looked so pressed and cute. And not like the other mothers who wore these, like, house dresses and things. She always had like a pair of little capri pants, sort of I Love Lucy-ish, I guess. And I opened the door, and there she is, and she had to be 80 years old, just as gorgeous as she ever was with the little French eyeliner, you know, that whole thing. And uh, we had the most lovely afternoon just reminiscing about sewing shoes. And at one point, she says, oh, I just remember I have something for you. And she runs back in the back and comes out, and she says, I have a shoe. <laughs> and I just about fainted. She had a shoe. And it was one of the shoes that we used to, I don't know why she still had it. And I looked, and there was the stitch. And so she was going over it and telling me how it was done and helping me remember the process. It was just wonderful. And the other person that I went to see is a man named Bunny Carver, Bunny Carver. And he was a man who worked with my father in the mill. And it had never occurred to me that I talked to him around maybe I was closing in on the first draft and I thought I had the whole story that I wanted to tell and uh, I had done a little talk to the Mexico Historical Society <clears throat> there are about three and a half people in this society <laughs> and uh, so I did a little talk over there and this man came up to me and said you know you need to you need to talk to Bunny Cava and I said, really, who is that? And he says, well, he worked with your father. He adored your father. And I said, well, I definitely want to talk to him. And so I called him up, still lived in Mexico. And I went over there one day. And he was kind of ill. I could tell you know, he was ailing. And he was about 85 years old. And he told me the story from his point of view of the morning my father died, which had you know, never occurred to me to think of the other side of it. I was thinking of what was happening in our little place hearing this news, but they knew the minute my father was even five minutes late, they knew something dreadful had happened. That's how punctual 
and reliable my father was. And the other thing that Bunny, his real name was Harry, but they called him Bunny. The other thing that Bunny was so kind and patient with me is he kind of brought me through all the processes that my father was involved with in, the, in paper making, which was a great uh, boon to me in writing this story, because there is a lot about how, how you make paper in an industrial setting. So Bunny was a great help that way. And alas, he did not uh, survive the year, and so he never saw the full book, and he did not see his name in the acknowledgments. But I did send a book to his widow, who sent me a very lovely note about that. So that's just a little bit about how, you know, how the book was written and how I did it. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be thrilled to ask. Yes. Yeah, we uh, just came back from, I spent four months in the uh, Maine. Oh, you did. It was right up, the, uh, up a long hill. 45 minutes. You know, I got her house, we got her house ready for sale. Oh. We right yeah, in March. Oh, my and condolences. All of a sudden, I had this house to go. Oh, my we goodness, a Quasic. We oh. Our, we did all our shopping in Mexico. I was in yeah, city. Mexico. You did? Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> but you can, the, the, the first thing that strikes an outsider is the, Enorm the, the enormous bill. Yeah. Like you said, you, you always see it from yes. everywhere. Yeah, it's the just the yeah. center of the everything. <clears throat> Setting. Mm -hmm. And even now, you know, that mill is a shadow of its former self. It has about 600 employees now, and at the time of this book, it had over 3,000 wow. employees. Yeah, it's... Um, it has a presence, but I can understand. It definitely still has the presence, yeah. yes. Oh, that's so neat. You know, I would drive around the town on Sunday in Mexico just to see what's going on in Mexico, which is nothing, of course. Yes. <laughs> I noticed the three-story um, houses that you mentioned. Yes, the, the blocks. Here, there, in the town, has got to work for this mill. Yes, so that's the lifeline. That's what but it was. I also, was very interested in the drinking establishments. Yes, many drinking establishments. And I figured uh, that's probably where there was probably a lot of activity on a Friday night. Yes, especially you know on my Irish and Catholic. Yes, and you have that right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <clears throat> yes, a lot of bars in Rumford, and Mexico, then and still, yes. Oh. Beautiful area. Yes, it is beautiful, isn't it? It really is beautiful. It's just ringed by hills. It's it's Very gorgeous. Beautiful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I'm glad. Nice. Good. Yes? Monica, tell us where your family is now. You know, your book, we really learn to care about the characters. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of like our family, so I'm very Oh, curious. thank you. You know, about your family. Yes. Well, the family um, is, uh, I can't say everything because there's a kind of a surprise in the epilogue, so you kind of have to get there. But I'll just say that everybody's thriving. And my uncle, Father Bob, is a huge character in the book. He was our priest uncle. And he died in 1984. Uh, and my mother died about 10 years after this book, uh, the time of this book. But the siblings are all well and happy and thriving. And my sister Kathy is. Uh, Vice, no, she's the vice president of student life at Assumption College in Worcester. I just visited her last night, and we talked half the night, uh, so she's doing great. I won't say anything about Anne because it's just so great, uh, and you just have to read the book to find out. And my sister Betty is wonderful. Uh, she, uh, this is my, bed, my sister Betty, who's mentally handicapped. And I don't know if some of you may have seen, I had a piece in Oprah Magazine last November about Betty. And it was about how she deals with grief. I don't know if anybody saw it. But um, anyway, I have another piece coming out about her. And it's, it's really, <laughs> it's, a, it's called This Just In. And it's about my taking her to um, visit her idol, who is Kim Block, who's our local anchor person. She's the CBS affiliate anchor person in Maine. And um, so I t she watches the news every single night religiously for 30 years. She's been watching Kim Block. And, and at one point, it, I looked and I'm thinking this little, Betty is tiny little person, size zero everything, with a little child size hoodie. And she's sitting there with her little TV tray of her same stuff she eats every single night, her little Debbie cake and her milk and her little casserole, and watching Kim Block. And there's Betty in her little pants and her hoodie. And there's Kim Block in her beautiful you know, silk blouse and the hair and everything, facing each other. And I was just so taken by that tableau that 
they really had quite a bit in common, so I wrote about that. And then um, a little bit later, after I saw this, I thought, you know, I'm going to figure out, in Maine you can do this. I knew somebody who knew Kim Block. And I said, Kim, my sister Betty is your biggest fan. Could I come and give her a tour of the studio? And she said, oh, I'd love to. She's a lovely person. So we get over there, and it's a big surprise. So we're outside, and Betty doesn't know where we are, although she saw the logo of 13 on there, and she's getting a little suspicious. And so you have to do an intercom thing. And I said, I pressed the buzz buzzer, and I said, Betty Wood is here for her, her uh, meeting with Kim Block. And Betty just looks, she says, Kim Block is the surprise? I said, yes. So we go in. It was just love. And Betty's a very friendly person. So Kim Block comes down. She goes, oh, hi, honey. I watch you every night. You do such a good job. And that's just what Betty's like. You just love her. So we go into the studio. And um, so we're sitting here, you know, special VIP, a little couch and everything. And they bring over this thing. And so Kim says, now, when that red light goes on, you have to be quiet because, you know, you can hear. I said, okay. So we're sitting there. Well, unfortunately for me, it was uh, quite a night of news. There was a hurricane coming, a propane fire in South Portland. What was the other thing? Some other big giant, oh, an earthquake on the East Coast. So earthquake, propane, fire, and a hurricane. So Kim starts the thing, and she's, she's saying the news. And then the graphics come on. So Bet, we can see the graphics, and we can see Kim. At the, this is the new news, so Kim was the only one. And when Betty saw the flames licking the sky, she goes, oh, like this. And I'm like, hey, no, 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 no. OK, so, oh, all right. And then and in other news, a propane a earthquake is done. And Betty goes, oh, this just gasped. So this goes on, and then finally, thank God, the football scores came on, which she has no interest whatsoever in. And there was some wrap-up story about something or other. So finally, the green light comes on. I said, OK, you can go. She beelines over to Kim Block. She says, Kim Block, did you hear about the hurricane? <laughs> and then she starts to repeat all the news she just heard, which is what she does every night anyway. And Kim just happened to be the person she was telling. anyway. So that, I wrote a piece about that as well. I don't know how I got off on that, but that's how Betty's doing. She's just absolutely great, just a, a delightful person in the light of our whole family. Yeah, thank you for she asking. Lives with one of your siblings? She lives with Anne. She has lived with Anne for many, many years, ever since our mother died. Uh, and yeah. When Anne got married, was she in her 60s? 68, her yes. Uh, she was, well, that's the epilogue. <laughs> yeah, my sister Anne got married two years ago. Um, for the first time to the love of her life and he, we love him to bits. He's like the best thing that's ever happened to our family and it's just so great. And yeah, Betty lives with them and they're all just one big happy family. Yeah. I love the section where you were practicing our town oh. and your mother took over. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks. That's my favorite scene in the whole book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, thank you. Um, I did want to say something my friend reminded me. I wanted to say one thing about the cover. This is, I'm only saying this because this is so unusual in publishing in 2012, <clears throat> which has become just a bottom line enterprise period. And any writer in the audience knows exactly what I mean. The designer for the book cover, this is Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And uh, I don't think I've ever had a book designer who even read the book, let alone read it and loved the book. So she designed the thing. There was This is an old family photograph of us at Niagara Falls. And my uncle, Father Bob, took the picture. This is about a year after my father died. And I love the way they extended the photograph all the way up. So it looks like my sister Anne is holding up not only her three baby sisters, but the entire sky. It's just a beautiful composition, I think. And then I turn to the back, and it's plaid. <laughs> Which I thought, well, it's an interesting artistic choice. Not wouldn't have been mine. And then if you look at the fine print in here, it's the Prince Edward Island Tartan, which is where my father emigrated from. And so I called the, I emailed Martha, who was the designer, and I said, that was, I love the plaid. She goes, well, I just thought we needed a little dash of your dad on your book cover. I know. I I just couldn't believe it. And then to cap it all off. There's a little photo credit, and it says, cover photo by Father Bob, who's my uncle, my beloved uncle. So it was just such a personal thing that I, you just you don't expect that right now, in the way publishing is. And I was so 
I, I was just completely touched by that, just the personal. The right. Yeah, this is my mother. And this thing, I really could not have composed this any better. This is my mother, who was just kind of in her Jackie Kennedy sunglasses, um, who looks, you know, she's just apart a little bit. She's very alone in her grief. And there's Anne, who's kind of holding up the three little, I'm the one, the beauty with the blue glasses in the middle. Uh, and this is Kathy, and Kathy and I were just joined at the hip, practically. And there's Betty, who's kind of looking off, you know, kind of her own little world. It's just, it's so, it's so perfect. And I didn't realize they were using a family photo. I, I, they asked me for some, and I thought it was going to go on my Amazon page, or I didn't know how they were going to use it. And I have seen this photo many times over the years. But when I got the jacket in the mail, and I looked at it, and I saw it in this context, I really, I just burst into tears. It was so moving to me. And I, I thought, this, this, is the dynamic of the book, exactly. So it, w it was just kind of a neat moment for me. It's intriguing, the title, because you don't know what you're getting into. I've had a couple of people actually complain that it's not about the Kennedys. Oh. <laughs> I'm thinking, really? I thought it was clear, but um, you know, you never know. But only a couple so far. Uh, but I think it's a really good title, too. I didn't pick it. It was, it was the the name of um, one of the chapters originally, but I was at happy hour with my friend Susan, who uh, gives me all my best material. And we were talking about the book, and it had a really crummy title. It's so bad I am not going to repeat it here. It was really a bummer title. And uh, she said, you know, I think that When We the Kennedys would be a great title for the whole book. I thought, huh, really? She says, yeah, it's just, you know, it's kind of, especially if you have a subtitle like, a memoir from Mexico, Maine, because it kind of doesn't go together, and people are wondering, well, what, what does that mean? I thought, oh, that's a good idea, and I used it, and my editor loved it, so there you go. So, you know, happy hour, glass of wine, my friend Susan, and you have a great title for your book. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you have to have uh, special permission to use the name Kennedy? Did I have to have special permission to use the name Kennedy? There's such public people that you don't need permission to do anything, um, which you can certainly see by any cover of the National Enquirer any week. Yeah, no, I didn't even think about that, honestly. Yeah. I know that one of them uh, received it on a plane. That's all I can say. So I don't know. No, I have not heard from anybody. Yeah, but I would think you know it's it's a very it's about how their sadness helped this little family that they had no idea about. And I often wonder about all the children who lost fathers that year, and all the women who lost young husbands that year. How if that was the same for them? And I, I bet it was. I bet it was this little phenomenon that most people don't really think about, but I bet my mother, I'm sure my mother was not the only one who got some, you know, a bolster from that. Very, very interesting. I think it sustained your mother. It did sustain my mother. Yes. I love the way you related to the nuns and the choir practice <laughs> and the Tom Yes. Everyone got such memories. Oh, thank you. How many Catholics in this group or lapsed? <laughs> Or it's, you don't lapse, you can't lapse. But you know what I mean, yeah. All together. Tantum ergo sacramentum venere murcher nui. Oh, boy, there, see? there you go. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks.